Next, guys, we're going to start talking about things like the cell line. Okay, and remember we're recording, so let's keep the talking down. So tell me about the cell line that we're wanting to do, guys. Who here wants to tell me about the cell line? Yeah, Adarsh. Uh, so what do you want to talk about? Tell me about, tell me about why we're doing a cell line. Okay, so a cell line would allow us to get an, an, a large amount of a lot of things you're looking for, like DNA, RNA, and proteins without having to kill a large number of cuttlefish or dissect them. Yep. And then like there are like multiple different ways to get that. So we're basically trying to take out certain parts of the DNA sequence yep. to make sure that the cells keep on replicating for a very long time. Yep, exactly. Exactly right. So we one of the big goals of this project is to generate a cell line from our cuttlefish. Right? One of the things about the mollusk family is they are very well known for being incredibly difficult to make a cell line from. People have tried and tried and tried. People spent most of the 50s and 60s and 70s trying to make a mollusk cell line. Nobody has actually done this. There is one cell line that people thought was from a snail, but it turns out that it wasn't. They thought for years it was from a snail, and when ATCC, which is sort of like the gold standard of cell lines, started doing these barcoding, when that barcoding came off, they barcoded their, their snail line they had, and it turned out to not be from a mollusk. I can't remember what it came out to be, but it was not mollusk. So we have nothing. It, so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to try and make a cell line from this. Right. In the old days, what you would do is you would add chemicals. You would typically add chemotherapy agents, things that are going to kill your cells, things that are going to stop cell division. Hopefully, that maybe you might be able to get one or two genes that are messed up, so you can actually get a lot of cell divisions to happen. Never worked for cuttlefish. Never worked for any of the mollusks. There's something special and interesting about them. Don't know what that is yet, but nobody else was able to succeed here. So why do you think that... So like, you know, it's kind of a question of, well, why do you think we can succeed here when others haven't? Right? Like, this is a great question. Like, there's been a lot of really good academic labs that have done this, but one of the biggest innovations that's happened in biotech in the last 10 years is CRISPR. CRISPR, I spell that right, yeah. It's CRISPR, right? CRISPR gives us the ability to fine tune and knock out genes in a genome, very specifically in ways that we haven't been able to do in a cost-effective manner. Ever. Right. Before CRISPR existed, the only real ways of doing this were things like zinc nucleases or like actually engineered proteins, which would cost things like hundreds of thousands of dollars per trial. Right. Things that are prohibitive for an academic lab, things that are prohibitive for a community lab, things that are really only cost effective for a pharmaceutical company. Right. And even then, at $100,000 a shot, it is an incredibly expensive thing to fail. CRISPR has brought this down, this price down, incredibly low, right? Does anyone know how CRISPR works at a very high level? What does CRISPR require? Yeah, Darshan. Uh, so CRISPR requires you to, like, I think, like, put in, a, like, it's kind of like a DNA sample, so it can... Yeah, it, re it requires a guide RNA. Guide RNA, so it can go into a specific part of uh, the yep. DNA and, like, cut it out. Yep. The guide RNA has a piece of it that's complementary to the DNA that you want to cut. And at that site, where it's complementary, it will cut. And when the DNA is cut there, it makes a double-stranded break, so your DNA is now separated. Do you guys know how a cell repairs this sort of break in the separation? Hmm? Speak up. What'd you say? It, it, there, that's a few things, okay? If these pieces overlap, if there's any sort of homology over them, in this case, if it breaks so it's, there's some overlap, these two pieces will come together and it'll just repair it, right? Homologous end joining? Homologous end joining, right. CRISPR typically makes a clean double-stranded break. The cell has no idea how to put these two pieces back together. There's no real rational way to do it, so it's got to guess. And there are a few different ways it guesses. Sometimes it adds a few more bases in, hoping that it might be able to find a few tails on the other side so it can then stitch it together. And that's what we take advantage of. We take advantage of the cell putting in a few extra bases. 
you guys know why that would be important if you put one extra base in? You know what one extra base does to a gene? It's called a frame shift, right? It causes a catastrophe. It's a big problem. So in your DNA, when you make your DNA to RNA, they are in terms of triplets. These triplets are called codons. AT, yeah, Frank? Uh, just a quick question. Um, so, so when CRISPR makes a double strand breaks, what's keeping the, the two strands from like just pushing away? Nothing. I think CRISPR holds on to it for a little bit, okay. um, but there's nothing that really prevents it from floating away. And one of the things the cell does though, once it sees two pieces of DNA that should, like it sees two linear pieces of DNA, uh -huh. and there should never be linear pieces of DNA that are just floating around. All the chromosomes are all capped with telomeres. Uh -huh. So you should never see these ends, all right? right? And when it sees it, it just sticks it on another piece. That's one of the ways that the cell fixes this problem. Which it's, enzyme does that? It's a whole set of so, enzymes called the Ku complex in humans anyway. Ku complex, K, okay. It's KU. Uh -huh. But I, that's about the best idea. There's a gentleman at Stanford named Gil Chu who used to talk a lot about this. This is why I know about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So say CRISPR cuts two chromosomes, two, two, the strands two in two chromosomes, does it potentially cut the pair mechanism, like fuse the two chromosomes together? Yes. It happens. Um, there are a couple of places in the, in the genome where chromosomes actually <coughs> kind of break. Uh, and these are actually very common in cancers, right? One of the famous cancers, it's called the Philadelphia chromosome. And in this chromosome, you get a piece, I think it's of chromosome six, just breaks and gets attached to like chromosome 21 or 20, 20 or something like that. I can't remember what the chromosome numbers. And what this does is it turns on uh, tyrosine kinase and forces it to always stay on. It gets rid of the regulatory domain of this tyrosine kinase. And so the cell is constantly dividing after this and it can't stop dividing. Actually, it's a very common lymphoma. We actually have a cell line of this lymphoma in the back. Uh, very, very, there, there are certain spots that are common to break. Um, where is it? Codons, sorry, I got distracted, guys. Codons, all right? We have these codons, and these codons are triplets, and they're always in triplets. So ATG always codes for methionine, all right? This is one that I know. I don't know all, I don't have all the codons memorized. Um, but ATG codes for methionine. So you have methionine, and here it would be another methionine. If we break the DNA here, and then we have ATG, and we stick another G in here, we now have ATG, GATG. So we still have our methionine, but we've now frame shifted, right? So everything after this break is bad, okay? Very bad, and this kills your protein. And this is what we call a knockout, right? This knocks out that gene, especially if it's early on. And that's one of the things that CRISPR does. It, 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 we make a double strand of break, the cell tries to repair it by sticking nucleotides into it, hoping that it might be able to find a complementary region to make homologous end joining. But often all it does is create frame shifts. And this is great for us because we can knock genes out. This makes it very, very, very convenient for us to knock genes out. And that's one of the nice things that CRISPR allows us to do. It allows us to knock genes out. And one of the big things that we're doing with this cell line is we are trying to knock out a gene called P53. Sometimes called TP53, same thing. Does anyone know what P53 does in humans? Yeah, that's it. Uh, it codes for protein that will kill the cell if there's a, there's a problem in the genome. Yep, exactly. P53 is one of these called a tumor suppressor protein. It is an incredibly well-studied protein. It's been very, very detailed study for probably 40 years at least. And what this does is this checks your chromosomes. If, if, T, if P53 comes around and sees that you have one of these double-stranded breaks, P53 will stop your cell cycle and will either force you into senescence if it's a bad break or if it's a really bad break, if there's a lot of breaks, it'll just kill the cell. Because it's far better to kill any individual cell than to allow it to proliferate, proliferate forever, right? That's the hallmark of cancer. You don't want cancer. Multicellular organisms do not want cancer. Uh, so P53 is sort of this master checklist of all, it checks all the chromosomes, it's always around. There's actually a lot of functions that P53 does. This is one of the big functions it has. Right? And almost all multicellular organisms have this. There's, and one of the reasons it has that is when you have a multicellular organism, it sort of suppresses that natural selection drive of any individual cell 
to take as many nutrients as it can to proliferate and divide. And when you have a multicellular organism, you now have to have cells that have to work together. So certain cells can't take all the nutrients, otherwise you're gonna kill the organism and kill everything. And, T and P53 is one of these that sort of helps regulate that process. Uh, but one of the things that can happen is if you take out P53, chromosomes then, there's no real check on it. So chromosomes can become unstable and in, in actually leads to what's called chromosome instability and you get chromosome fragmentations, you get chromosomes stitched to other things, and a cell still divides because there's no real check on it to stop it. And eventually you end up with some cancerous cells or cancerous lesions. And that's one of the goals that we have for this project is we are taking CRISPR to specifically target P53 in the cuttlefish. And the hope is, is that if we use P53, to, if we knock out P53, we then have a cell or some cells in there, something will happen will have some instability that will hopefully lead to something like telomerase turning on. Does anyone know why telomerase would need to be turned on? Adarsh, do you know why telomerase would need to be on for to keep a cell growing? Cell layers keep getting cut off and if they yeah. are fixed too long and the telomeres are cut off, then the actual DNA gets cut off and you can't properly read the genome. Exactly right. Telomerase will help with the cut off. Exactly right. There is a huge problem with linear chromosomes that eukaryotes have that prokaryotes do not have. All right, prokaryotes, they have a nice genome. It's circular, you divide. When it divides, it replicates it in a circle. When it hits the end, it stops. It's very nice and easy. But part of the mechanism of how DNA replication occurs is you use a primer. And these primers sit at the ends of the chromosomes and you divide, you multiply, and you rep replicate a whole chromosome. Right, you do this in pieces along the whole thing. What this means though, is the very ends can't be, uh, can't be replicated, right? You get the very ends of the chromosomes, can't be replicated. The solution to this problem is to make these things called telomeres, which are pieces of single strand unit kind of loop around, just pieces of nucleic acid that loop, right? And these things are sacrificed with every cell division. You sacrifice some of the telomere. At every division, you just sacrifice a little bit of it so it doesn't go into the actual chromosome. It, this part doesn't actually code for anything. It's just sort of a protective cap. And this cap is special. So when we get rid of something like P53, there's no longer a check on these other genes that elongate and extend the, chrome, the telomeres. And so you can have these telomerase turned on, which will make this telomere grow very long. And if that telomere grows very long, this cell can live for a very long time. And if you get a cell that has telomerase active at a good concentration, you can get this to add telomeres at the same rate that it releases, or that it's turned off, or that you lose it. And this is one of the hopes that we have, is that we can make this change here. There's a lot of other things that go in to making these immortalized cell lines, and that's why P53 is a really hot one is because it will do this instability for us and we can sort of sample everything that survives over the course of a week or two after knocking it out. We don't have to sit there and actually fine tune everything. We can sort of take a large population and say, what survived? And sort of use natural selection to its own advantage here. Now, one of the things about P53, and one of the reasons we picked P53 for this, aside from the molecular biology of it, is that you have about 70% of human cancers have an insertion, deletion, or mutation in P53. This is a really, really, really critical protein. Most of our cell lines that we have in the back for humans, they have a defect in P53, which leads to the chromosome instability, which leads to all these other genes getting upregulated or downregulated that shouldn't be there, which leads us and gives us a nice immortalized cell line that will grow forever, where all we have to do is supply the nutrients to it, and we'll just keep growing and dividing It'll keep giving us all sorts of nice, beautiful cells that we can investigate. We can take its cytoplasm. We can investigate its organelles. We can look at its gene expression without actually harvesting a cuttlefish each and every time. Yeah, right. Doesn't the cuttlefish have like three copies of the gene? Unknown. It is not known how many copies. That was an aberrant experiment that would never reproduce. So we did have one experiment. What Frank's alluding to is we had one experiment where we were amplifying P53, and we saw three different bands on the gel. Right. These three different bands would denote three different introns, which would mean three different copies that never reproduce. So, yeah. Aren't you worried about 
Uh, you said there are other side effects of P53 being knocked out. Oh, yeah. Aren't you worried about, I mean, are you basically just creating like a, a cancerous blob? That's exactly what we're cancer cell line? Yep. Okay. That's exactly what our cell line is. It's basically a, some, a cancerous cell that will live forever as long as we provide it nutrients. That's what we want. Right? We want that sort of cell here. Not with using CRISPR, right? But I, again, for human cell lines, we have a thousand human cell lines that we know of for humans that live forever, and about 50 to 60 percent of those all have a p53 mess up. And p53 is typically the progenitor mess up uh, in all of these cancer cell lines that we have. It's usually you can usually trace it back to a p53 defection. Yeah, Fran. Something I've always wondered about cell lines. I mean, so. Um, generally, they're messed up in some way or mm -hmm. another. Are they messed up so much that they're not no longer characteristic of the original organism? It's a great question. Great question. The Do DNA. The question. A cell line, because they're messed up, their genome's messed up. How much do they relate to the original organism? Okay. The answer to that is the DNA doesn't mean anything, right? It's going to have an aberrant number of chromosomes. Those number of chromosomes aren't going to match with the cuttlefish in our tank. The DNA itself, if we were to sequence the DNA, we're going to end up with a lot more copies of genes than would be normally in the one in the tank. But the nice thing that we have is all of the genes here are still present. The biochemistry of the cell should still be the same because it's still the same copies of things. The actual proteins involved are all going to be the same. We're not changing any of those proteins. We're just changing the P53 of it. So uh, the cell biology should still be the same. The biochemistry chemistry should still be the same. The genomics will no longer be the same. We can still get the same genes, but they just won't be any relevance to what the genes are. Like we'll get it with nine copies, 10 copies, two copies, zero copies, and we won't know the answer compared to that. Yeah, Henry, we'll get 10 seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. If you frame shift the P53 gene, wouldn't you frame shift the other genes connected to the P53, unless it's on its own chromosome? Yeah, go on. So you have your chromosome, right? And you have a bunch of genes here. This intergenic region, I think we kind of alluded to this before. This intergenic region doesn't really matter. And if we frame shift one here, it's not, we're not gonna bother at all this because this gene over here is on a different promoter and it's gonna start at a different spot. Um, if this were a bacteria where you have a polycystronic gene or a virus, right, where you have like six genes on the same mRNA, then you would. But eukaryotes don't do that. Eukaryotes don't put more than one gene on a single mRNA. That's a good question. Jay? I just had a couple questions. Is, as a strategy, um, does it make sense to upregulate telomerase as, as, a, you know, as opposed to knocking out P53? That is, that is a, yeah, that is a fine, fine thing to do as well. Oh, okay. and in fact, a lot of cell lines are done this way, mm -hmm. is to upregulate telomerase. Um, there are a few issues with that. Um, cells still, over, for whatever mechanism, will still exhibit senescence, usually. Okay. And even if you upregulate telomerase, you end up with really nice long telomeres, but eventually the cell sort of stops. Um, and it's, I don't really know if the mechanism is known for why that happens, it may be, I just don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but knocking out P53 actually solves a lot of those problems. And there is absolutely no problem at all with taking telomerase. Uh, Elizabeth Blackburn was up at like UCSF, so she's famous for doing this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and using telomerase to make these cell lines. I see. Um, but usually they don't last forever, they last a long time. I got it. Now, if you knock out P53 and you get more genetic chaos, yep. you know, happening because you don't have the mechanism to control yep. it, does the genetic drift on all the genes eventually cause problems with protein um, expression? Uh, because usually not. Okay. Um, usually it doesn't. There's still proofreading capabilities still in the in the cell, and genomic drift like that takes it's very long. Okay. You can in fact get point mutations here or there. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't seem to actually matter that much. So the proteins are stable then? They seem to be stable. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is, if it's kind of like sticking sand in your engine, right? Like it's very unlikely, that, like you put sand in your engine, it's very unlikely to make a better internal combustion engine. Yeah. Uh, you're much more likely to kill it. Yeah. Uh, and that same sort of thing happens even on a cellular level, right? Like you mess up one of, you get a mutation in one of your essential genes, and you've now killed the cell. The cell just can't survive. If you mess up actin, it's dead, right? Like you can't right. live without actin. You mess up myosin, you mess up a lot of these other things, the cell just can't survive, and so it dies off. I see. Uh, and you sort, of, you sort of select against that sort of behavior in some ways. Yeah. But you can, you can get drift, especially at that codon. I mean, I haven't really talked much about the triplet, mm -hmm. but that third base can vary, and it can happen. 
Right. Um, right. Okay. But whether it's actually relevant, you know, it's not really that relevant. You know? Yeah. So does it mean that insertion needs to be on the text box? Yes, it does. Exactly right. And in fact, we target that, and that's the nice thing about CRISPR. We're not randomly in the old days. This is how you, in the old days you really had to randomly try and break the chromosomes. You use things like radiation. You use things like colchicine. You use all sorts of chemicals and drugs to like try and get these chromosomes to break or to stop and to make weird divisions. But that's the nice thing about CRISPR, in fact, that we can actually tune and say exactly where we want it to break. And we can say we want it to break exactly at this exon right after the start codon, so it, the gene's dead. And we may not be successful with any individual one, but we could go through and we could test 10 of these or even 100 of these. And any individual one of these CRISPR guide RNAs are, you know, they can be as cheap as $3, typically probably closer to $50, but uh, if you wanted to like just buy it straight, the $3 one requires you to make the RNA. It's like this is a DNA purchase where you make the RNA. This is where you just buy the DNA or buy the RNA. But even like you do 10 of these times 50 is $500. Like that's still a reasonable cost for an experiment like this. Whereas $100,000 to do one is just like insanely prohibitive. And if you're wrong and it doesn't work, then you've just blown $100,000. So even trying 10 is a million dollar project and that's just prohibitive and not really useful. Uh, so it's, it's really nice that we can do this. In fact, and that's exactly right, we target the exons. And we usually you target the first exon because it will frame shift everything. So even if you get alternative splicing, Sometimes, I think I was alluding to this dirty little secret before of alternative splicing. Sometimes you don't get exon two, sometimes you get you know different exons. You usually get exon one, um, and that's why you target exon one. Yeah? Is the P53 gene very well known for the codfish? It is, in fact. So, one of the nice things is P53, it is in every multicellular organism that I know of, right? Including the cuttlefish, including the related cuttlefish, including squid, octopus, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and we know it, We know there are certain cuttlefish that have been sequenced, and we know P53 is there. Um, and in fact, one of the bioinformatics groups, one of the big things that they've been doing is looking at it from aficionalis. So aficionalis hasn't really been fully sequenced. They have the transcriptome has been looked at, and, and they've been able to pull out P53 from the transcriptome. And it actually- Is that the bigger one? Yeah, it's the large, I don't know how big it is, um, but it's much, much, much bigger than this one. Do you know how big the aficionalis is, Maria? Uh, I th uh, so I think I was talking to Trist about this because, like, size wise, yeah, the transcript of it. No, 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 I meant the just the animal. Physical. Oh, the, f the physical uh, animal, physical animal, they're 18 to 24 inches. 18 to 24 inches is the yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so they require a uh, 400 gallon tank. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these I'll are take your arm, <laughs> these are 15 20 gallon tanks. Um, we can have a, yeah. we can have up to five to eight, ten eggs per tank. Yeah. Um, so, cuttlefish. Yeah. So, yeah. But we just. I guess the reason I ask is that when you're when you're creating your guide RNA, you want to know exactly what you're trying to match. Exactly right. And that's exactly what gets us. Put it down this better. This is exactly why we've gone through this whole process of looking at the DNA and the RNA. All right. As we talked about before, the DNA is big has a lot of these introns in it, makes it very difficult, right? RNA contains all of these protein sequences and they contain all the codes for it. They all have a poly A tail. We can actually amplify off the mRNA and get all of these mRNA genes from it. And one of those genes is going to be P53. And that's very, very nice for us. Uh, because we know what the aficionalis P53 is, we know what all these other squid P53s are, as soon as we have a tra some transcriptome data, we can actually align and pull out that P53 to be, to, so it's perfect. In fact, because P53 is pretty well conserved, we could probably make some good educated guesses, and we have made some good educated guesses on what some really good guide RNAs would be um, for our cuttlefish. We could probably take a stab forward, I bet it would be right. Um, but we're not gonna take that stab yet. Right? Um, so we have a few different options for getting that P53 sequence, right? And one of the options is just to sequence everything and look at what's aligned to it. Okay. Another thing that we've been working on is doing alignments. So we take things like squid, take things like octopus, 
to things like another cuttlefish and say, how are their P53 genes similar? Right? Where, are the, where do they differ and where are they similar? Right? We know that these species, the squid and the cuttlefish, diverged something like, I don't know, 60 million years ago or something like that. And so if you see similarity between the cuttlefish and the squid after 60 million years, it's probably pretty likely that they're going to be fairly well conserved um, between the other cuttlefish that's in sequence and our cuttlefish. It's not a definite, you can have some drift in there, but it's a better stab than nothing else. And we can use that sort of behavior and look at these sort of constant regions that we see across 60 million years of divergence and say, can we actually design this? Can we actually see what this sequence is based off of this, uh, those relationships? And so that's one way of doing it. We've been trying to do that. I think that's like the most, the current way that we've been really looking for the P53 sequence. Now that we have the COX-1 sequence working, we actually have a positive control. So we know that the P53 should or shouldn't work. Before, we had no idea. When we were seeing negative results, we didn't know, is it the DNA? Is it the polymerase? Is it the primers? Now we can actually say with some confidence, it's not the polymerase and it's not the DNA. So it's probably the primers. The other way that we can do this is there is an old technique from the 1970s where they took a, a dog cell line called MDCK and they took this dog cell line and they said, okay, we found this gene in dogs, right? If this gene is in dogs, it has got to be in humans, right? So they isolated the, the RNA and they turned it into DNA. And this is dog DNA. They affixed it, made it what's called a column out of it. They immobilized it, put it onto a column, passed over human DNA, and said, what bound? And when they did this, they were able to find out and pull out the human strand and sequence the human strand. So, way before, 25 years before we even sequenced humans, they were able to find this gene that they knew was in dogs. And the reality is we know now, now that we've had you know, you know, 25 years of experience from these people, that the difference between human genes and dog genes across the whole genome is incredibly small. Uh, but it ended up being a really, really nice experiment and really showed the closeness of the mammals. Uh, that humans and dogs, like you could actually fish out these human genes from the dog gene. And we'll try that same experiment, yeah. How did they prepare the human DNA to pass through the column? It's a great question. You do the same sort of thing that we did with our cuttlefish, we do an RNA extraction. Okay. So you take a soup, you take your cell, you extract RNA, because what you don't want is introns, all right? You want no right, introns I here, see. because oh, okay. the introns are allowed to diverge, and the introns do diverge. Take the in, you take the, the RNA, you extract the RNA, you get mRNA, you reverse transcribe the mRNA uh, okay. into DNA, you break the DNA into single strands, and put it over the column and add it. So you've got individual genes you're running through. You're just adding soup. Yeah. And you do this, you don't do this with like 10 cells, you do this with like you, I, like liters, tens of liters of cells, you probably have, you know, one to a hundred milligrams of RNA is what they put on, or starting out. They Lots. See uh. DNA. They use a lot. It takes a lot. Mm -hmm. This is not. This is not for a small number of experiments. This is a. This is a big amount of work. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we're a little more fortunate um, in our current day that we don't need to use this much. Our techniques that we have now are much more sensitive than they were 25 years. Or this is actually 40 years ago now. Uh, much more sensitive now. Almost 50 years ago, um, then they are. They're so much more sensitive. Now. Does anyone use this technique today? It's typically not done because you just sequence. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, doing next gen sequencing has really just changed this entire calculus. Right, I see. Uh, next gen, you can you can sequence everything and get all this information, and the time it takes to do something like this is just it, like this preparation of doing like the, preparing a milligram of RNA is just it's too much work. But for a sizable yeah. genome, that's somewhat expensive, right? To do next gen, yeah. It can it can be sizable. It, it can be expensive. But the reality is, like compared to your cost, yeah, your right. time. Yeah. You have a human doing this. This is like you know a week of work. Yeah. And you basically paid for your sequencing and then some in that week of work. Yeah. So uh, it's just not sequencing has just changed everything. So we don't have to do these old good good old biochemical techniques.
Um, so, especially because we know human, like we have a reference genome, so it doesn't like once you have a reference genome, it doesn't everything is easy, everything falls into place. Uh, so we can do this as well. This is one of the other options that we have is to do this, uh, and this will help us pull out P4T3. Not a guarantee, but it's a good shot. Right. So we'll take these genes. We can knock out P53. Hopefully we end up with the cell line. What do we do with the cell line, guys? I think we talked about it briefly. Well, what do we do with the cell line? What can we do with it? Why do I care about making a cell line? Yeah, Josh. Well, so there's like a lot of other interesting properties of cells. There's things like other chromatophores and surface that you probably want to look into. Yep. And like, for example, like if, like if we want to look further into kink or other like inhibitors in the DNA or yep. Like you said, we don't know much about the organelles if they're any different from humans, so all those things within a monocell line you can look really far into. Yep. There's, there's a whole lot of things. We don't know anything about the cell biology of this, all right? We don't know anything. Is the Golgi stacked like it is in humans? Is it fragmented like it is in yeast? Do we have how many mitochondria? Are the mitochondria, do they get one big mitochondria? Do they get many mitochondria? Is the ER contiguous with the nucleus and going through the whole cell? Is the ER just close by? Is it making a vacuole? Is it making lysosomes? Like, we don't know anything. We don't know anything about the cell biology of this. And this is one of the- Is this a really good microscope to see cell event? You could, you gotta get cells first. You gotta get cells first. Yeah. And that's exactly what you do. You get the cells, you get a lot of cells. You can get a few cells, I guess, if you wanted to like scrape some off. Put it under a microscope. I mean, this is what like Camilla Golgi did in like, I don't know, 18, 90 something when he was identifying the Golgi. He just like took some cells, put it under his compound microscope from antiquity and started sketching things off. Uh, and that's exactly what we'll do. There's, it's a it's fine technique to do. I mean, we have cameras now and we probably won't sketch it off. We'll take a picture of it. Uh, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, and that's what we'll do. There's a lot, like I said, a lot of really low hanging fruit, a lot of really big unknowns that just no idea and they can be really informative um, and so we have a lot of good that's the cell biology stuff and like you were saying before the chromophores how the cuttlefish change colors I find it fascinating what I really find fascinating about the, the cuttlefish though are their ionophores the fact that they can polarize light is something that's really really weird to me it's also they can selectively polarize yeah that's anyway they can they can polarize light okay. um, and how you get something like you know cells are on the order of 10 microns and polarizing light requires you to have some like tunability on the hundred of nanometer scale. So how do you actually get that in terms of a biological context? And I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, and I think that's like a very interesting question. Like how do you like mesh these like these physical properties with what biology is doing? It's clearly doing it. We know it happens. And how does it work? And how does it actually do this? I, it's one of the big ones that I'm curious about. Uh, but we have all sorts of things. How does it make ink? What is its ink components? What are inhibitors? I think a great thing that you can do is start testing all sorts of different compounds on these cells and say, does it kill the cells? There was a, a, a light oil spill in the South China Sea in, the Indian, in near Indonesia where these cuttlefish live. And it's releasing all of these really, really low molecular weight uh, hydrocarbons. And we don't know anything about what those do to biology. This is one of these nice things that you could actually take the cell line, add these sort of compounds and say, is this actually a problem for the cuttlefish? I would guess so. But we could actually really see if it's a problem. We could actually see what genes these things are changing. Like, what is the cuttlefish cell's response to some of these stimuli? And this is a great system to do it with because we now have an infinite number of cells. We have a whole possibility that are always reproducible. We don't have to actually harvest and grow up a cuttlefish. I think those of you guys who have been here for, you know, who have been in the project for a long time, it's not easy growing this cuttlefish. This is our oldest cuttlefish by far. Right? This is the first cuttlefish we've been able to get to eat goat shrimp before he eats these tiny little mycids that we have shipped in from Florida once a week. And now we can at least just go down to the aquarium and buy out the aquarium of goat shrimp, <laughs> which we do. I mean, we have really, we've really taken the whole South Bay and every, every Petco and PetSmart in the area missing coast trip because of us yeah run on yeah yeah I mean one of the goals of the other tank in fact is to be able to like keep large numbers of them so we can actually get alive
so we don't have to keep going to the store every fourth day or fifth day. And it's, which is still cheaper than having the mysage you know, shipped in once a week. And it would be very nice and convenient to have a really good cell line that we can reproducibly test our hypotheses with. Right? And this is one of the big goals. And this is a big win for biology as well. It's a big win for science. The first cell line for a mollusk, first cell line for a cephalopod. I mean, mollusks are a big, big king. Like, they're a big phylum, right? Very big. Uh, and we can do a lot of really good testing. This is a really good holy grail. Yeah. Does that mean we can sell it to other labs and make lots of money? Yes. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And if it works, we can show that you know a lot of these Absolutely. cephalopods that are endangered um, in the wild could potentially make cell lines from relatively easily, um, and allow us to do research on them. Um, and it could be a very urgent need with climate change to be able to know how to do this. So this isn't like a theoretical. It would be nice to. This would be very big. What are, yeah. After we do it on the first uh, cuttlefish, can we do it easily on other cuttlefish, octopus, and so Absolutely. on? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Once you have sort of the baseline and the baseline understanding of how to do it, then we can really start moving forward. We can sort of just like crank, like turn the crank at that point. And any sort of mollusk we wanted, we could probably make an immortalized cell line in short order. So. We could even set up some sort of a service if you really want an immortalized mollusk service. I don't know why anyone would want that, but you know, let the market decide. Um, but one of the big hurdles that we have for all of this is figuring out even like what do these cells need to grow, right? Every cell needs things like a carbon source, it needs a nitrogen source, and it needs growth factors, right? And this is one of the early things that we tried with the early cell lines is figuring out what are the carbon sources we need, what are the nitrogen sources, and what are the growth factors we need. Uh, some of you that have been here for a very long time with us remember the shrimp extract we did a few years ago, um, where we took live shrimp, ground it up, and did, used that as our growth nutrient. It turned out that shrimp extract didn't really work nearly as well as fetal bovine serum, but it was a good experiment to do we did a good job. It was a really fun time grinding up, you know, shrimp and doing some really good old-fashioned biochemistry. Uh, but one of the things that we really found with our early cell line work with the cuttlefish is there are interesting things like it likes galactose more than glucose. That makes sense. Hmm? That kind of makes sense. Oh, it does? It doesn't make sense to me. So, <laughs> uh, to me, things should should eat glucose. Okay. Things should like glucose. Glucose goes really nicely into glycolysis. It goes really nice into TCA. Uh, galactose, I mean, it clearly, the data are clear that it likes galactose more. It, this is not a weird phenomenon. It turns out there's a lot of aquatic things really like galactose more than glucose. Um, but I couldn't tell you why. I'm huh? thinking maybe the chemistry of glucose is more, is it more favorable for man, animals and man, plants? Well, I don't know. Uh, clearly it's preferring it. It's doing something with it. I don't know what it is. Um, but it likes glucose, or it likes galactose. It also likes a couple other, it likes FBS more than shrimp. Um, which I find, this is always one of these things that I think is incredibly interesting, is that you get things like from a vertebrate, like a cow. And these growth factors from a cow work incredibly well with things like a cuttlefish, all right? These things, I mean, they diverged hundreds of millions of years ago. But I think it really tells you like the like things that are important to biology and especially things like these growth things in early development are very constant and they stay around and they just, I mean, biology just sort of <coughs> using those same tools and modifies it. Um, as Uli likes to point out to me, like embryology, you can sort of like go through and see all of different stages of life. You can see like these invertebrates, like in the early stages of embryology, as it moves to these things with tails and gills, the gills close up, uh, you know, before you get to things like a human, you sort of march to these steps. Um, and the fact that this, this fetal bovine serum works and can keep these cells alive, these cuttlefish cells alive, is just astonishing to me. Uh, so this is one of the other nice things that we've done. Yeah. Okay. Do we understand all you know the media now, or is it still a work in oh, progress? Uh, we have a working understanding of the media. Okay. I wouldn't say we have solved this problem. I wouldn't say we understand it well. 
we understand it well enough to move forward. Okay, so it's we, not, a, not a big problem. Not a big problem. This is one of these things that we can keep these cells alive for a few weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all we need is to keep it alive for a few weeks. Right. And we can keep these media changes. And in that time, once we then have a cell line that can actually survive poorly in these conditions, we can then actually start yeah, modifying it and, and making a nice tree out of it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the other curious things that came out of these cell line work is there's an old media called L15. L15 was developed in like 1890 or 1880, late 1880s to the early 1890s. Um, this was a media to keep chicken cells alive because they would, in the old days, they would take an egg and then like crack the, the egg off, the shell off and start pulling cells and pieces out and putting it in the dish and keeping it alive in a dish. And this is one of the media that they used in the ancient times to do that is this L15. Um, and it turns out that this L15 actually is one of the better medias that we have. The carbon sources and the, uh, the, amino, sor the amino acids in this seem to be the right concentrations to keep them alive. Um, again, another crazy, like we've tried modern media, we tried all, sor we tried all sorts of cool things and this was it. Um, so we kind of have a good sense for what our growth factors are, what the media should be, what our carbon sources are. <coughs> So we're pretty, I'm pretty happy with how that has moved forward on in effect. Um, but one of the things that we do need are cells, right? We can keep these alive for a short period of time. We can't keep them alive for long periods of time. We need to be able to keep them alive long enough to do the CRISPR editing on them. And hopefully we can start seeing things actually live a lot longer than a few weeks once we start doing some CRISPR editing. Uh, and that's sort of where that project sits right now. And it's a nice spot. And we really need more cuttlefish to actually proceed more with this which are incredibly hard to get. Yep, I'm currently, yeah. yet again, browsing right now, looking. Yep. Um, <laughs> Is it only the dwarf cuttlefish eggs? We're looking for dwarf cuttlefish eggs, yeah. And they're the only ones you really see. Occasionally, maybe once a year, I've seen a flamboyant cuttlefish. The price difference is dwarf cuttlefish eggs go for eight to $15 an egg. Flamboyants go for about 800 to $2,000 an egg. And, and they are egg. venomous, so I'd rather not have the flamboyants in here. They're about the same size as the dwarf. I mean, because we could. I might have found some, but they're, I was told they're like white, so they think it's not uh, dwarf cuttlefish eggs. Uh, we might take them. Might take them. Yeah. I take them. Okay. Yeah. I take them. If it's a cuttlefish, I take them. How about this? If we think they're cuttlefish, bring them in and we'll sequence them and we'll see what's going That's right. Hang on. We'll sequence them. <laughs> sequence them. We'll box one of them. How much would, would sequencing cost? To do a good job and you know uh, we do transcriptome first the full genome would cost us a few thousand dollars uh -huh. plus um plus like uh informatic bioinformatic time right uh, but that would solve many problems right it would solve a lot of problems i don't think that's the best answer to start with i think the transcriptome is transcriptome the best okay. and that'd be a few hundred it's a few hundred okay transcriptome is cheap it's small i mean as we said like we're talking one to two percent of the genes yeah yeah transcriptome okay uh, and we can get a really good idea. And what that really does, uh, getting us the transcriptome, is it gives us a scaffold. The real hard part of full genome sequencing de novo is aligning. All oh, right. Um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to get these 300 million base pair chromosomes to align to 150 base pair pieces. Yeah, it's a and hard problem. It is a is a really hard problem. Yeah. Whereas you know a piece of mRNA, any of these genes, on average, are about 1,500 base pairs. Much easier. So. You know, aligning 150 base pairs onto 150 uh, to a 1500 base pair thing, fairly trivial, relatively trivial. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is a dual. This is a very solvable problem in an easier, easy way. This is a very hard, challenging problem. Not that it's not possible. It's just very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the common way of doing this this way right now is to do long reads and short reads. So use long reads as a scaffold. So use like PacBio, which is like I 10 see. grand per read or per sequence. Wow. Uh, with the Illumina short reads to like fill in the gap information. Mm -hmm. but, uh, just the deep pockets is the way to go. Yeah. I was just curious, how far did you get on the transcript? Um, well, we were having a lot of problems. What we ended up stopping is when we couldn't get the, uh, the PCR reactions to work, we couldn't even get our reverse transcriptase reactions to work either at the same time. Um, so one of the big things that we decided to put a stop on getting the RNA until we could actually figure out how we can get it clean. Because um, we spent months and months getting and trying to extract terrible RNA preps 
until we finally got to the point where we figured out we needed a good positive control and we started working, really working through that. Um, and, and fortunately, right around the time we solved this problem, the cuttlefish just like, the supply just dried up. Um, and so it's unfortunate. So we didn't get very far in the end because by the time we figured out the problem and figured out the solution to the problem, really it was figuring out the solution to the problem, the supply of cuttlefish dried up. Um, which basically leaves us the one in the tank we have. We have one frozen in the back that we froze right away that I found when we were cleaning out our minus 80. Um, and he was frozen as an embryo, so he should be okay. We could probably you know, do the work on him um, and that might help us move forward. But it'd be nice to have more than one sample to tell you the truth. It'd be nice to have a bigger end than one. Um, I would like an end bigger than one, but you get what you get. Another reason we need cuttlefish. Mm -hmm. Because no one likes my idea. It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> We've become friends. He's been named. <laughs> I wasn't sure we were going to take a sample off this one. Yeah. No. He's my buddy. We can't do that to him. <laughs> He's my buddy. Which is kind of funny considering that I was like, ah, in the old days before we became friends. Now he recognizes me. Yeah. It's a lot harder to harder to harm when he comes up to the tank. I'm not saying we kill him, kill him. I'm not saying we kill him either. We'll see where we're looking in February. So you voted with the scope not No chocolate. That's not happening. He's my buddy. The problem is I started feeding him. Before when I started feeding him, before he was just a science experiment, and now he's a friend, so. Yeah, I know, it's a problem. Um, yeah. No idea. I suspect it's not easy. I, and I will tell you, they they are they will cannibalize. They will eat them. They eat, eat other cuttlefish, um, which makes me think it's probably not the easiest thing to you, breed. You need them, a pretty big tank because know. you can't sex them very easily. So you can't just take a male and a female. You would put a, quite a few in, and they get fairly. The males get aggressive with each other. So I guess that's one way to figure out you have males. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, they're not the only. The first place in the world that ever figured out how to breed this species was California Academy of Science, uh, Richard Ross's lab up at the Steinhardt Aquarium, and uh, he didn't do that till the first ever successful breeding of them was in 2009 in captivity. So it's only been 10 years, and you know, if we can get enough of them, yes, absolutely, we'd love to do that. Can you raise them? That's what we this do. one is. Oh, this guy came, he would hatch from an egg, you know, the size of my pinky nail. Yeah. And they don't they, ship well, so we only get eggs. Yeah. No cephalopod ships well. They ink in their bags, and their own ink will is kind of toxic to them, um, and they'll suffocate in it. So if they're adults, they do very, very poorly shipping. So you said about $15 per egg. So mm -hmm. Why not just get them? Well, if we could get them, we would. I am I am looking on no every corner of the internet for eggs. Nobody has had any for a while, um, so we're getting a little concerned. I'm trying to find turnover stones. That's what I've been doing. Been doing this meeting. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is where we stand on this project, right? So, in the process of making the cell line, we've got a lot of good pieces going on. We have a lot of information that we've discovered. Um, and this is where we will move forward from here on. We have a lot of people working on CRISPR. We actually have the enzyme, we've purified the enzyme. We have to do another purification step to make it even more pure right now. It's about, I would guess, if I were guessing, about 70% pure, which would probably get it to about 90, I would guess. That's the Cas9. The Cas9, yeah. The Cas9. And how are we uh, purifying that? Uh, it's a, we're doing ion exchange chromatography and immobilized metal chromatography. So use metal. Uh, use metal that has like a divalent metal, like uh, you can use, we use nickel, you could use cobalt, you can use zinc, zinc isn't very good, um, cobalt's quite good. Uh, and we take advantage of what's called the histidine tag, which is this nice imidazole ring. Lost the bond. It's got a lone pair on it, and this lone pair makes a dative bond with metal. And so with a string of these histidines together, you can actually use a metal to pull it out. This gets you things about 70% pure right away. We'll then use ion exchange chromatography. We'll use what's called an S, a salt, uh, S column. And this is a sulfonate. And it's negatively charged. 
Um, and this makes sense for why Cas9 will bind to a negatively charged thing. Why do you guys think that Cas9 will bind to a negatively charged? It's positive. positive. Why would it be positive? DNA is negative. Because DNA is negative. Exactly right. And it works well. This is a great purification technique. We can actually get it to 99.99. I mean, Chris Hackley gets it to like 98% to 99% pure just by these two steps. And then they're fast steps. Um, Hardon used to get it to 99. He was very careful, uh, which is good. Um, so we got that's moving nicely. We need some sequence data. It'd be nice to get some more cuttlefish for sequence data. Um, I think we have the bioinformatics group that's trying to pull out things like telomerase. We can actually, if we have telomerase gene, much like what Jay was saying you know, a bit ago, we could also add it in. And I love doing more than one experiment. Like, I, I am not a believer in putting all of your eggs in one basket. You know, you try three, four, five different things, and if only one of those works, that's great. And if four or five of those works, that's even better. Um, so I, I think that's a great, pla uh, great route. We also have a bunch of other oncogenes you guys have looked at and have sequences of. Uh, we can take advantage of things like twist bioscience. I love twist. Um, they'll synthesize all of these genes for us so we don't have to do any real work. Um, in the old days, you would need to extract the mRNA, reverse transcribe into cDNA, then try and amplify up your cDNA to get your construct. Now we just have twist synthesize it because it's faster, cheaper, and better, and homogenous, uh, which is always a good, good thing to have. Uh, yeah. Do you think we have enough information to try out a few guide RNAs? Yes. Okay, so once we get the Cas9 purified? Uh -huh. In fact, yeah. We have uh, positive control. We already have the positive control, so we'll use the positive control. Mm -hmm. We have DNA, mm -hmm. so we'll use the DNA. And we have some guides, then we'll test the guides. And we'll Great. See. I see no reason to wait. Yeah. Um, Might as well I mean, try. We, in, I mean, in the, in the perfect world, we would have the cells growing right now regularly. Mm -hmm. um, but in, since we don't have the cells growing right now, I mean, I still think it's best to get the assay all working, get everything point where it could work right away as soon as we do get cells that we can electroporate and make make this happen. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of just moving forward. Yeah. Um, I'm wrapping up here right now guys so I don't know if you guys have more questions, comments, thoughts, where we're going next. Yeah. The, the cells that you were able to grow for a couple of weeks, yeah. did you ever freeze them by the cells? We did not. Um, we were testing, the big experiment we were using at the time was can we get them to survive and how long? Um, the success rate of freeze thawing is already not very great. And that is another entire set of experiments to figure out how we can freeze these cells down. Uh, but yeah, did not try it, and we will, but yeah. Yeah, yeah Frank? Uh, what about, we did a little research on the nuclear and pork proteins. Oh, yep. What was, that, what was that for? If you have Cas9, and you want to cut DNA, where does Cas9 have to go? Oh, so Frank's question is, um, they did a lot of work on nuclear localization signals, and Frank wanted to know why do we do all this work on looking at nuclear localization signals in cuttlefish. So I'm gonna ask Frank, or anyone else, where does Cas9 need to be if it wants to cut DNA in a cuttlefish shark? In the nucleus. In the nucleus, so Cas9 has to get here. What is on the outside of the nucleus that prevents it from things from getting in? Hmm? Yeah, there is a membrane here, right? This membrane is contiguous with the ER, and there are things called nuclear pores that sit on the endo on the nuclear membrane, right? In the nuclear envelope, and those pores require a nuclear localization signal to enter. It's a, it's a it prevents anything from going into the nucleus, so only things with the right code can get into the nucleus. And this code is typically things like two very, very basic amino acids. Things like two lysines next to each other, two arginines next to each other. Um, these are the things that this nuclear, this pore looks for to allow things in. Cas9 is a bacterial protein. Bacterial proteins have no nucleus. So it natively does not have that. So we need to make sure that this Cas9 has a nuclear localization signal. And one of the big outcomes from this is that over the course of the divergence between humans and cuttlefish, the nuclear localization sequence has not changed dramatically at all. So we actually are going to use the human nuclear localization sequence. Yeah, Josh. So will like viruses that infect the cuttlefish also have that nuclear? Yes. Yes. If it wants to enter the nucleus, it will have that. 
HIV. Yes. Viruses have these. Viral proteins that need access to the or let me, me rephrase it. Viral proteins that have, need access to the nucleus will have these. Not all viral proteins need access to the nucleus. Yeah. It's like your driver's license <coughs> goes through like a magnet. Or a key card or a key even. <laughs> Nothing can get through. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, guys. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. So we're gonna see people on Wednesdays, right? Wednesday's lab night, and we have Cas9 to purify. There's some PCR.